Rubens' earliest known teacher was Tobias Verheit. He was a landscape painter. We know that Rubens was only there for a little under a year, and we don't see really any influence from his teacher Verheit on Rubens' work. He moves on, and his next teacher is Adam Van Noort. He's there for more like three years, and there's not very much influence there either, even though he was there longer. Uh, Van Noort was a portraitist. Uh, this work that we're looking at here, The Portrait of a Man by, uh, from 1597 by Rubens, that's Rubens' first known work after leaving Van Noort's studio. So we do know that he has that portrait tradition, but really on the whole, we don't see a lot of continuity between the style uh, of the two artists. After that, Rubens is going to train with Otto von Venn, and he's training with him from 1595 to 1598 in Antwerp. Uh, von Venn, sometimes von Venn, you'll hear, he had a really high uh, respected reputation. He was a loyal Catholic. Um, he was a Romanist, meaning he trained in Rome. Uh, even though we have these kind of things between Van Ven and Rubens in common, they're both loyal to the Catholic Church, they will both be well respected, they both spend time in Rome, uh, we don't see a lot of influence of Van Ven and his style on Rubens. The thing that really comes across from Van Ven's tradition in Rubens's works are the intellectual kind of aspects that Van Ven really emphasized. He was a humanist. He was emphasizing the learning of the Renaissance. He did a lot of drawings uh, and he really practiced that Renaissance diseño. He looked a lot at classical works. All of these are things that Rubens continues to do in his works. We know that Van Ven was really influenced by emblem books and Rubens was as well too. These emblem books are made up of images with accompanying Latin passages that are really kind of uh, very often either moralizing or they can be more of uh, allegorical kinds of meanings, but essentially just putting words and images together to convey different meanings or to like inspire debate. When we look at Rubens, we're going to see that that classical training, that emphasis on learning is really going to be key to understanding his works. Rubens is actually going to spend time going to Latin school. He's going to learn quite a bit about antiquity. They're going to read antique texts and study them. And in fact, we know that in Rubens's studio, he would often listen to antique texts being read aloud as he works. We know he read the texts of Ovid and Virgil himself. He knew Latin and Greek. He didn't rely on others to retell him these stories. He could read them in their primary languages. So he really had this erudite background and a lot of classical knowledge. He uses this and combines it in with his works. He incorporates it into his subject matters and he really raises the status of painting from a craft into something that's more intellectual. And that's something that's really important to a lot of 17th century artists of the day. They want to be elevated in the, the social kind of standing of the time. They don't want to be seen as someone that just works with their hands. They want people to understand that painting is something that takes incredible amount of intellectual dedication as well. Rubens also collects antiquities. So not only did he have classical kind of studies, but he also owned classical kinds of objects. And he uses all of this then to uh, really emphasize the classical in many of his works. We know in his own home in Antwerp, his first house, that he had like a classical theme going on and that really focused on like classical gods as allegories. Uh, we know that he had a huge library. He had this huge collection of ancient sculpture and gems and coins and antiquities. He had also a huge collection of paintings, nine by Titian, 12 by Bruegel. He has some by Durer, by Holbein, Van Eyck, Van der Goes, Elsheimer, Brouwer, um, Van Dyck, Jordan, Snyder. So all of these contemporaries and prior artists from the North and from Italy are in his own collection. So he was really just uh, very well rounded in terms of his learning and in terms of his artistic knowledge. He was a learned artist. He was a pictor doctus. He was an example in the age when it was so important to many artists to be seen as such. But even though he emphasized the learning and the education that was necessary to make art successful, he did not neglect the manual technical aspect of creating art either. Um, and Rubens was really well known as a draughtsman. He was an incredible 
um, draftsman. He was really a practice and extensively made sketches of antiquities, of other paintings, uh, and on and on. He was always sketching. Here we're looking at his drawing of the Belvedere torso and the torso itself on the right. Uh, this is a work from Classical Antiquity, and he does this sketch in his uh, first years in Italy, in the early part of the 17th century. He will continually draw from the works of others and from the antiquities as a way to kind of inform his future work. When he's seeing these other works, he's really picking up on what some other artists have done in the past, and he's starting to use that to form his own direction. From antiquity, we're really going to see him picking up on compositions, motifs, um, of course, motifs not only encompass like objects, but also storylines uh, and figures from classical antiquity. We're also going to see that he's really influenced in Renaissance artists, Michelangelo, Titian, especially, even though Raphael and Leonardo do have some influence on Rubens, it's kind of more minimal. For Michelangelo, we're going to see that those huge muscular figures that Rubens is known for in very expressive poses, that's something he really picks up on from Michelangelo. This whole practice of doing multiple sketches and drawing to work out your design, disegno, this practice of disegno, that's something that was very important to Michelangelo too, and we see that in Rubens' works. From Titian, he picks up on this kind of painterly lush brush stroke that's really kind of loosely applied, um, and he picks up on Venetian rich colors colors that are very atmospheric, those lush kind of landscapes and atmospheric effects. We see all those coming into Rubens' works as well. He's also influenced by some of his contemporaries, so not just works from antiquity, not just works from the Renaissance, but also works from the Baroque themselves. Uh, first, Caravaggio. He sees Caravaggio on his first trip down to Italy. He really loves the tenebristic lighting that Caravaggio works. He loves the drama that Caravaggio employs. He loves how Caravaggio draws the viewers in by using foreshortening and other kinds of viewer involving techniques that really make the viewer feel like they're a part of the scene. And Ruben starts to use those. He also sees the work from the Karachi brothers, especially their idealized figures and their classical and kind of mythological type of subjects and themes and he starts to use those too. In addition to that we have to understand that Rubens is influenced by artists who preceded him in the north in the Renaissance in the 16th century. We already mentioned that he had some of those paintings in his own collections uh, but we have to just understand that his heritage there in the north is one that emphasizes really believable textures, rich luminous saturated oil colors, and minute, very convincing types of details. And he combines all these kind of artistic influences with his knowledge of classical and ancient history and really comes, um, comes together in a sophisticated kind of art that not only is easy to understand for the masses, but is also appealing to more erudite types of circles. When all of these influences come together, it creates the style that Rubens is known for. One of the strongest characteristics Rubens is known for is his operatic drama. These are works that are potent. These are works that are full of really intense kinds of emotions, really exuberant kinds of feelings. And he conveys those emotions in a couple of different important ways. First, through the poses, the faces, the stories that he's telling, right? So he uses the figures and the narrative, but he also uses composition to kind of increase that dramatic impact. He uses a lot of dramatic lighting with tenebrism, lots of strong kind of contrast in lighting, but he also uses, uh, uses a dynamic dynamic and active kind of composition that adds to the sense of energy in the work. He uses painterly strokes and those two imply movement and we as viewers pick up on that sense of action. He also uses the figures and the compositions, puts them in, in motion, uses diagonals and the compositions to again imply force and um, you know thrust in his works. All of these things kind of work together not only to create something that's really emotional but also something that's really full of action and that action is emotional in and, itself, in and of itself. He's known for his idealized figures but they're not just beautiful figures. They're like, for the men, very strong, titanic. I mean, these are guys that are super muscular, that are like bodybuilder types. For the women, they are on the opposite side of the spectrum. Soft kinds of anatomy, soft flesh, really kind of giving uh, and, and uh, you know, 
full figured women. And he does female nudes all the time. In fact, his, his women become kind of so well known for this kind of fleshy characteristic that they're often called Rubenesque. And that's a term that we use even today in art to apply to any sort of fleshy, abundant kind of female form, even if it's not in a work by Rubens. He, he does look to classical precedents for his figures, especially for his male figures. The Hellenistic era was influential on Michelangelo, and of course, Michelangelo is influential on Rubens. Rubens sees both Michelangelo and Hellenistic works. But we have to understand, too, that it's very classical in the way that he approaches the anatomy in making it very convincing, correct anatomical kinds of proportions, correct muscular, musculature underlying the flesh, uh, correct types of poses that look very convincing. That's very classical. Rubens is known for his rich, strong color. There's a lot of earthy tones, a lot of warm tones in his works. He's known for carrying his drama even into the skies. The skies always look like they're, or very often look like they're on the verge of a storm. It's really kind of dramatic kind of, kind of weather in the works. And of course, he is known for carrying on that northern heritage of texture, color, and detail. As we mentioned, he was really into sketching as a way to prepare for his works. He does do traditional pencil pen kinds of sketches, but he also does oil sketches along with those drawings. Um, he does all of these in preparation for the final work. So in this slide, we are seeing some sketches that he's done, the first two images, of a classical sculpture and that's the third image and then we see that he also takes that into a oil sketch right there that last image on the far right uh, these are all kind of studies that he does to prepare for his final work right and this is a work of Seneca and the final painting dates from about 1614. He doesn't often copy them outright into his own compositions usually he adapts them or builds on them and you can see that he's done that here by adding in more narrative to to the um to the basic kind of pose and figure of Seneca throughout his career Rubens is enormously influential he travels around he spreads his style he has a very well uh, well respected reputation that too makes his style appealing to other artists he has a huge studio with tons of students <laughs> That spreads his style. He's incredibly prolific. I mean, we have over 3,000 surviving paintings, engravings, woodcuts, designs for tapestries, book illustrations, sketches, all of the things that he produces during his career. Um, he could even have more pupils than other masters because he paid less taxes on his commissions. That was one of those perks that he had working for um, Ferdinand and Isabella. So even so, he really was incredibly influential and he was an incredibly hard worker. He felt like his hard work was essential to his success. He kind of saw himself as a self-made man. He didn't really come from a privile privileged or a status background, but he kind of r rose up and uh, became very well-liked and admired and charismatic and charming in not only artistic circles, but also in diplomatic circles. In all of these ways, he was able to really become uh, incredibly influential. And if we look at the way that he disseminates his influence beyond his lifetime, um, he not only has this incredible reputation during his life, but he enhances that by spreading his works through prints, right? He'd have prints made after his paintings to kind of disseminate his style and disseminate his works. And his reputation only grew over time. After his death, he continued to be well-respected. When we get into the Rococo, we'll have a whole group of artists known as the Rubenistas that want to revive his style. So he's a really well-known and respected artist. And today we even consistently appreciate him.